there's no doubt that humans have shaped the world for hundreds of millennia, but now we're doing so with increasing speed, zeal, and impact. In 2016, there are nearly 7.5 billion humans on the planet, twice what that number was when I was born 50 years ago. All of us need food, shelter, water, space, and community. We are in a precarious moment, and theorists of the Anthropocene drive this point home with clarity. As you can see here, Stefan et al. tell us that the human imprint on the global environment has become so large and active that it rivals the great forces of nature. Uh, Hamilton and Grinwald convey that we're in a kind of hybrid earth, of a nature injected with human will, however responsibly or irresponsibly that will may have been exercised. And the geographer Earl Ellis, in a wonderful overview of the Anthropocene, tells us it's no longer possible to understand, predict, or successfully manage ecological pattern process and change without understanding why and how humans reshape these in the long term. The roots of humans' ability to shape our planet, ourselves, and other life on it are extremely deep. I'd like to suggest deeper than many want to admit or realize. My argument here is that it's not just that um, symbols have affected us. They have, in fact, made our biology. Our biology is not a biology that's simply in response to the physical natural world. It's a biology in response uh, to what symbols have done to us. My goals in this talk will be then to provide to the personalist tradition some experimental evidence that I believe converges with and supports the personalist intuitions about the person as a being that coexists. I'll also try to make accessible to evolutionary researchers from different disciplines the notion of the person as that which reveals more properly what our humanity entails and also try to enhance the Thomistic theological and philosophical understanding of the person with a characterization of rationality as existing with others. And lastly, I try to draw some conclusions related to the encyclical Laudatio as it deals with uh, individual responsibility and cooperation. So deontology, what is it? It's this high level concept for knowing how to bind one's will to another. This is a concept and it takes a lot of time to learn. It looks like, like infants do have this capacity to learn it at birth, human animals do. Um, we understand it in terms of, and you can see it linguistically here, uh, morphologically, obligation to binding our will to another person. And that's so we act on the behalf of another person and vice versa. Francis proposes dialogues that are honest and transparent in decision making. He believes that these dialogues will include a special place for the poor and the marginalized and all those persons and perspectives that are often ignored in global development strategies. The basic argument is that human capabilities with the advances made in the sciences, technology, and symbolism have created spaces and possibilities that also impact in both life-giving or life-enhancing and deadly or destructive ways. To quote, um, uh, I'm quoting Sister Farina, um, such capabilities are not automatic forces for good, end quote, or the, the good for humanity and the other creatures we share the planet with. Justice is often short change in the march towards progress of a materialistic and naturalistic kind. Consequently, the pleas, as Sister Farina puts it aptly, for a deeper consciousness about our shared existence in this common home and a personal, real, a personal realization of a need for just stewardship of this home that humans can promise the common good. <laughs> 